Every year, all around the world, millions of tons of copper are produced. With it, cables, parts, and components are manufactured that keep our cities, industries, and homes running. It is present in motors, circuits, appliances, and even in the charger of your phone. But where does this metal come from, the one that has accompanied and transformed the history of humanity? To find out, we will travel to Chile and enter the largest copper mines on the planet. So, subscribe, leave your like, and let's get started. Before showing you how copper is obtained in today's massive factories, tell me, how do you think it was done thousands of years ago, when there were no machines and no technology? The story begins more than 9,000 years ago, when the first societies found pure copper on the surface of the earth. They shaped it by hammering it with stones to make tools, ornaments, and simple utensils. Then they discovered that if they heated it in bonfires and let it cool slowly, it became more malleable making it easier to create more elaborate pieces. Later came smelting, heating minerals such as malachite or azurite in clay furnaces fueled with charcoal to obtain liquid copper that they poured into molds. The extraction was exhausting and manual. They dug shallow pits, collected exposed veins, and used fire followed by water to fracture the rock. Very different from what copper production looks like today. And in case you didn't know, the name copper comes from the Latin cuprum, which in turn derives from A.S. Cyprium, metal from Cyprus. This island was a key production center in antiquity, exporting the metal throughout the Mediterranean and giving its name to an element that today we use all over the world. So, how are millions of tons of copper produced nowadays? It all begins in open pit mines, like Chuquicamata in the Atacama Desert of Chile, one of the largest in the world, producing more than 300,000 tons of copper each year from millions of tons of rock. Extraction begins with detailed geological studies, including sample analysis and prospecting techniques to identify deposits with economically viable concentrations. Once located, layers of waste material are removed to access the ore. In Chuquicamata, the deposit can reach 100 meters deep, requiring colossal machinery and tons of explosives for the operation. Drilling machines create around more than 100 blast holes, each 16 meters deep, equivalent to a five-story building. Each hole is loaded with explosive, usually ANFO, which is a mixture of ammonium nitrate and fuel, covered with inert material to contain the blast. The detonations are activated in sequence with two millisecond intervals, fracturing the rock in a controlled way to minimize dust, reduce dispersion, and maximize the amount of copper-bearing ore. This pattern ensures that the fracture is efficient, allowing the extraction of the largest possible quantity of economically valuable rock. After the explosion, once the area is safe following inspections for gases and stability, mechanical shovels load the material. Each scoop lifts tons of dark, heavy rock. From one ton of ore, only six kilos of copper are obtained, meaning that processing one ton of the metal requires almost 200 tons of ore. Giant mining trucks transport the material along internal roads within the mine. The entire operation is coordinated from a control center similar to an airport tower where operators monitor in real time the position of vehicles, productivity, and safety using GPS and cameras. Up to this point, copper cannot be seen with the naked eye. It's only piles of rock, which is why we must move on to the next stage of the process to extract it. The extracted ore is classified as oxide or sulfide, each with a different processing method. For oxide ore, which represents a smaller but still important portion, it is piled up in leaching zones located on the outskirts of the mine. These piles can reach several meters in height and are irrigated with diluted sulfuric acid for weeks or months. The acid slowly filters through the material, dissolving the copper into a solution rich in ions. The solution is collected in lower ponds and sent to the processing plant. There, it is combined with an organic reagent in a special channel, which makes the copper float to separate it from impurities such as iron or manganese. Afterwards, an acidic solution increases the concentration of copper, preparing it for electrodeposition in an electrically conductive state. This concentrated solution goes into a series of tanks that contain thin copper plates called cathodes. By applying a continuous electric current, the copper ions begin to deposit themselves onto these plates. In just 10 days, each plate reaches a thickness of about 2.5 centimeters and a weight close to 125 kilos with a purity of almost 100%, essential for applications such as electrical components where conductivity is critical. But this is only one way of obtaining copper. For sulfide ore, which makes up the majority of deposits, the process is more complex and energy-intensive. It begins in a gigantic drum called a primary mill, 
where steel balls of various sizes crush the wet rocks into smaller fragments. The ground material passes through perforated screens that separate the particles. The smaller ones move forward to secondary mills for fine grinding, while the larger ones return to the primary mill to repeat the cycle. This process is repeated over and over again until a fine powder, similar to sand, is obtained. Once pulverized, specific chemical products are added that coat the copper particles, making them stick to air bubbles, along with a foaming agent. The mixture goes into flotation tanks, where air is injected, creating bubbles that carry the copper particles to the surface. That copper-rich foam is collected and filtered, producing a concentrate with a purity between 25 and 30 percent. This concentrate is partially dried to reduce weight and make transportation easier. From there, the concentrate travels by train to the smelting plant, often located kilometers away. In enormous yards, it is mixed in layers with silica sand, called flux, which helps eliminate impurities during melting. At extreme temperatures of up to 1200 degrees Celsius, the mixture melts in a reverberatory furnace until it becomes a glowing liquid. The slag, formed by iron and other minerals, floats on the surface and is removed, while the copper, denser, sinks, reaching an initial purity of 60%. Just as in mining each stage is key to transforming rock into high-quality copper, your support is fundamental to continue bringing stories and processes like this. If you haven't done so yet, subscribe and tell me in the comments what other material or process you would like to discover. But continuing with the journey of copper, the mixture moves to a second converter furnace, where oxygen is injected to oxidize remaining impurities, raising the copper content to 98%. The molten residue is poured out, forming a stream of glowing slag that flows like lava and when cooled with water, solidifies, becoming either a permanent part of the mining landscape or recycled into construction materials. Meanwhile, a crane transports the liquid copper to another furnace, where final purification takes place through processes such as fire refining, increasing the purity up to 99.4%. Then, the molten copper is poured into rectangular molds, shaping large slabs called anodes. These quickly cool with water sprays until they solidify, and a hydraulic cylinder ejects them from the mold. An automated system carries them to a rinsing station, where jets of pressurized water remove the remaining mold release agent. Afterwards, the anodes travel hundreds of kilometers to the refinery, where maximum purity is reached. There, they are submerged in tanks with electrolyte, a solution of sulfuric acid and copper sulfate, and placed opposite thin metal sheets called cathodes. By applying an electric current, pure copper detaches from the anodes and deposits onto the cathodes, while impurities such as gold, silver, or arsenic accumulate at the bottom of the tank as anode sludge, which is recovered to extract valuable metals. The result is copper with 100% purity, perfect for manufacturing high-demand cables. But at what cost? Mining has always left its mark on nature, and it is not something recent. In fact, copper production during the Roman Empire left traces that can still be detected in Greenland ice cores. These records reveal peaks of contamination by lead and other metals between the 6th century BC and the 3rd century AD, proof that even in antiquity, large-scale metallurgy already impacted the environment thousands of kilometers away. But continuing along the production line from this refined copper in the form of cathodes begins the transformation into products such as wire and electrical cables. The cathodes are transported by trucks, trains, or ships to specialized factories, stacked and secured with metal straps or wooden pallets to prevent damage during the journey, which can last days or even weeks. In the wire factory, the cathodes are unloaded with cranes or forklifts and sent into a gigantic smelting furnace with thick walls capable of withstanding more than 1,000 degrees Celsius. The furnace is sealed tightly, and the copper is gradually heated until it melts, transforming from heavy plates into a brilliant liquid that shifts in color from deep red to orange and then white. During this phase, engineers carefully monitor the temperature, pressure, and atmosphere to avoid oxidation or impurities, adding special fluxes if necessary to eliminate any remaining slag. The molten copper is poured into special molds to form thick copper bars, known as wire rods, each weighing several hundred kilos and with a thickness similar to a human wrist. These bars are partially cooled and then move into the drawing process. Machines stretch them through a series of progressively smaller holes, gradually reducing their thickness. A single wire rod can pass through 30 different holes, often lubricated with oils to reduce friction and heat, transforming into a fine wire less than one millimeter thick. Immediately after the last hole, the wire is sprayed with cold water to cool it down, causing the water to sizzle and turn into steam as it touches the hot metal, 
solidifying it and giving it the strength and flexibility necessary for use. The wire is automatically wound into enormous coils, each containing kilometers of material, enough to wrap around a football field more than 60 times. From just one kilo of copper, approximately 40 meters of standard wire can be produced. Now then, how are these copper coils transformed into the cables that will carry electricity? To create electrical cables, which require greater capacity and safety, the simple wire is further processed. First, multiple strands of fine wire are twisted together in stranding machines to form multi-strand conductors, which are more flexible and resistant to fatigue than a single thick strand. For example, a common household cable may contain 7 or 19 twisted strands, depending on its diameter and intended application. This twisting is done in rotating reels that spin at high speed, ensuring a uniform winding without excessive torsion. Once twisted, the conductor enters the insulation phase. In automated machines called extruders, the conductor is fed from the coil into a device where plastic granules, generally polyethylene, PVC, or flame retardant materials, are heated to temperatures of 200 degrees Celsius until they become viscous. The melted plastic is pressed through an annular nozzle with the conductor passing through its center, forming a uniform, smooth covering with a controlled thickness, typically from 0.5 to 2 millimeters, depending on the voltage. The insulation can come in different colors for coating black or white for neutral, red or blue for phases, green or yellow-green for ground. Immediately after leaving the extruder, the cable passes through a cold water bath or cooling rollers to harden the covering quickly, preventing deformations. Automated systems, such as lasers or ultrasounds, check the coating's thickness and detect defects like cracks, bubbles, or irregularities, which could cause short circuits or failures. For more complex cables, such as high-voltage or shielded ones, additional layers are added. For example, a layer of metallic shielding is applied around the insulation to protect against electromagnetic interference, followed by an external PVC covering resistant to weather conditions. In underground cables, a steel armor is incorporated for mechanical protection. These layers are applied in sequential extruders or winding machines, with tension controls to maintain integrity. But beyond cables, did you know that copper is also used in the strings of musical instruments? Yes, because of its flexibility and acoustic conductivity. In guitars and violins, strings wound with copper produce rich tones, showing an unexpected application of this industrial metal. Finally, the finished cable is wound into large coils or rolls, labeled with information about the manufacturer, supported voltage, maximum current, length, and other technical specifications, and it is ready to be shipped to warehouses, stores, or direct clients in the electrical industry. And this is how millions of tons of copper are produced every year. What did you think of the process? I would love to read your opinion in the comments. If you learned something new, don't forget to leave your like and subscribe so you won't miss the upcoming stories about how the objects we use every day are made and how they work. See you in the next video.